Dahmer elected to eat some bicep tissue because he was kind of a bicep man. That was his favorite thing to look at in a potential sexual partner. He thought that would be the part most worth incorporating to himself. We went through every aspect of his life. We talked about every single crime he'd committed in exquisite detail. We talked about all of his sexual desires and interests. And I believed he was telling me the complete truth about it all. I certainly was able to see what the world looked like to him and to feel that I could understand from his point of view how all of this happened every step of the way. Dr. Dietz became Jeffrey Dahmer's confidant after the killer was arrested. The forensic psychiatrist would serve as an expert witness for the prosecution. I spent um, three days with Jeffrey Dahmer in the library to the judge's chambers. Um, sometimes there'd be law enforcement in some area nearby. I don't know if they were always there. We were alone in the room. There was and never anybody else present in the room. Uh, he was not handcuffed, and I never had any concern whatsoever. Why not? Well, I'm not his type. Jeffrey Dahmer was on a futile search for a passive, compliant, non-demanding sexual partner who wouldn't leave him. And he tried every maladaptive strategy imaginable to achieve that. Jeffrey Dahmer's search for a submissive partner included lovemaking with an inert department store mannequin and attempts to create his own zombie lovers. It ended after 17 young men were dead, their bodies sexually violated and dismembered. The one thing he never learned how to do is to find a consenting partner who liked the same things he did. For each of his homicides in Wisconsin, he had tried to make sure that no one saw him come home with the victim. If he came home by cab, he'd be dropped off on a different street a block away so that the cab driver wouldn't be able to identify where Dahmer lived. Dr. Dietz would also examine Dahmer's interests in movies, porn, slasher movies, and some that surprised the psychiatrist. I gave Dahmer the remote as we watched his favorite movies together and asked him to stop at parts that were significant. First, in what were gay porn movies, he stopped at several places to show me what he thought were particularly attractive buttocks or biceps, his favorite being biceps. But while watching some other favorite movies of his, uh, I was surprised at what he thought was sexy. Uh, one was uh, in a Star Wars movie that he thought that Darth Vader's power was particularly sexy and appealing, and he wanted some of that. The soft tissue was all to be eliminated, but he had hoped to retain some mementos of some of the crimes. What he hoped to be able to keep without risk of being caught was 10 skulls and two skeletons. All of the dismemberment and the vats of acid and the um, tissue in his refrigerator, this was all part of a production line that he set up to try to thoroughly dispose of the remains so that he couldn't be charged with the crime. He was extremely cooperative in talking about the most personal, uh, sensitive kinds of details. And I felt it was a joint exploration to try to understand how he got to that point in his life. The evidence he knew it was wrong to kill is overwhelming. He went to enormous lengths to destroy evidence. He was staying up nights trying to get rid of the evidence. It's part of why it fell apart for him at the end that he couldn't get rid of the evidence fast enough. So he gave up and just drank. Dr. Dietz scoured the police file looking for clues to Dahmer's state of mind. He had a security camera mount and put up a fake camera in his apartment in order to deter burglars from coming in because he was afraid somebody might break in to steal a stereo and find heads in the refrigerator and then he'd be busted because they'd call the cops. So to prevent even accidental discovery, he put up a fake security system, a fake alarm system, a fake camera. All of that shows awareness of wrongfulness and an effort to evade detection. Dahmer sketched out a dream of his for Dr. Dietz, an altar he wished to build festooned with human skulls. He really loved the power that Darth Vader had to intimidate and influence those around him. And he had it in his head that if he could use a particular table he had as an altar 
and get 10 skulls and two full skeletons and the right candles and lighting and a chair like the one Darth Vader had in Star Wars, he'd have a sense of confidence and power that would make him able to attract men. And then he had this kind of primitive idea that you are what you eat. And it's that idea that he could make them part of himself and keep them alive through him that caused him to try eating some tissue from a couple of his victims. By studying the evidence, Dr. Dietz was able to surmise Dahmer's recipe. The only food in his apartment was a sack of potatoes and some onions under the sink. So I figured if he had recently eaten any human tissue, it would have been with onions and potatoes, and it was. Dahmer was impressed that I figured it out. He denied any candlelight, denied any wine, but did admit to looking at photographs of the victim while eating the tissue. And he had cooked it, and he wanted a remembrance of the victim. He had hoped that maybe this would be a sexual experience for him, but it wasn't. Jeffrey Dahmer did tell Dr. Dietz in graphic detail. The best we could figure out as to how eventually some of the gross kinds of images that happen with mutilation of a human corpse could become sexy to him were his thinking about dissection of animals while masturbating as an adolescent. He had done high school biology class dissections and also had collected some dead animals from the woods and kept their body parts. Now, most kids who would have those experiences don't think about that as they masturbate. They instead think about a cute human. So that's a mistake. And a public service message would be don't think about roadkill as you masturbate. Dietz argued in court that while Dahmer had sexual disorders or paraphilias, they did not compel him to kill. People do have sex drive. They do want to do it but they're also capable of refraining from those actions. Dietz also argued that Dahmer could control his sexual urges. I asked him how he protected himself from sexually transmitted diseases if he was with hustlers, and he said that he always used a condom. That's the first that information had been learned, and it seems to me that someone who has the self-control to wear a condom is doing better than the average teenager. And not once did Dahmer tell anyone that he felt driven to kill. Instead, he said, I hated to kill them. His drinking more alcohol to overcome his inhibition against killing is very important evidence that there was no compulsion to kill and no impulse to kill and that he could conform his behavior. After Dr. Dietz's testimony, Dahmer was found to be legally sane. Two years after his sentence began, Jeffrey Dahmer was killed in prison. I was sad to learn that Dahmer had been murdered. Maybe his dad and I were the only ones who were sad, but, but I was. Um, and that, that's it's not the right, it's not the right way to go. The man had been sentenced to prison. He hadn't been sentenced to death. I give people a lot of credit when they come forth with the whole truth about what they've done and when they take responsibility, and he did. He stood up like a man about what had happened. Wasn't weaseling and explaining and denying. Dahmer knew he'd gone way off course, was puzzled by it himself, admitted to the police and admitted to me and admitted to others what he'd done and as best he could why he'd done it. 